In some ways, the OBS 31 beta is a huge win for NVIDIA users. The couple new features and reworks really benefit those of you streaming on NVIDIA hardware. But there's a couple little updates that help everyone else as well. The NVIDIA background blur that you use with the Video Effects SDK, which you still need that SDK installed, as well as the general NVIDIA blur filter, which is just a graphics card accelerated blur across your whole screen, versus the background blur, which automatically removes the background of your webcam and blurs it out. Both of those are now available in OBS Studio without a plugin. You don't need StreamFX, you don't need to pay for anything, you just need the NVIDIA Video Effects SDK installed and a 20 series or newer NVIDIA graphics card. And there are different SDKs for which generation of graphics card you have to install. These are available just in normal filters as well as the general background removal filter that was added a few versions ago in the update, which is really neat. I stay pretty mixed on these filters on the whole. I love that they exist. I love that they are GPU accelerated, which means your graphics card makes them run faster. It's less work for the rest of your system. My problem is that they're still not super convincing. And when you see the artifacts of them, like if I flip it on right now on this webcam, even on a tiny amount of filter, like this is a very low level of blur. I can even like this is the lowest level of blur possible. It does a decent like it's not going to convince you that you're on a very expensive, you know, camera with a shallow depth of field or anything, but it does a lot to mask kind of if you have mess in the background. But, you know, movement could be ignored. But like, you see it around my chair and just kind of flickery around my face and things like that. Those little artifacts that <laughs> show up immediately can be very distracting. Um, and to me, that's not worth the trade off most of the time. And by default, it's set really high. This is the default setting. So, Perhaps it's a very isolating and pleasing image, especially if your webcam is not the full frame like it is on my scene here. But then you still see it behind my chair and my glasses flicker in and out. Sometimes it starts cutting off the side of my face with my glasses. And then if you ever move your hands, you really start clawing your way through the fog, so to speak. I, it's hard to recommend using them. That being said, you do have the option. This is with the background removal turned on just to show the solid color underneath because it does give you alpha channel. I personally just don't see myself using them. Regardless of whether I'd personally use it, there are still plenty of effects you can do with it. I know uh, Finite Singularity puts blur effects to great use and things like that. So it's cool that it's involved or integrated without the need of an external plugin. The second NVIDIA specific update is the with relating to the audio effects. Uh, again, that requires a separate SDK to download and install on your system. But then if you have one of those NVIDIA cards, you get access to you have uh, background noise removal, room echo removal, or the combination of background removal and room echo removal. That is now its own separate filter. It previously was looped into the noise suppression, so you had RN noise, I think SpeX is one of them, and then you had the NVIDIA one. It is now moved out to its own filter, just to make it easier to find and separate it from the others. Um, and if you already had that applied to your audio device, then that will just be brought out on its own. Lastly, for NVIDIA stuff, a big one. They have completely reworked the NVIDIA encoder again. Last time this really happened on a big level was in like 2019 with the new NVENC update for RTX 20 series cards. This is a complete rework of the encoder to provide better performance, more options, and to start laying the groundwork for more features that may come with future generations of graphics cards which is always exciting to hear, even if we don't know anything about that yet. Specifically with this update, we have little things like the Psycho Visual Tuning, which was a dumb name from the, from the get-go, has been renamed to Adaptive Quantization, which is more or less what it's called. It uses Temporal AQ, or Adaptive Quantization, quantization and Motion Adaptive Quantization, and uses them both with the same toggle. This basically analyzes your frame with changes over time, as well as movement within the frame itself to kind of optimize the encoder. This is recommended for low bitrate streaming, say six megs H.264 to Twitch or something, not recommended for high bitrate recording or using CQP recording or anything like that. So that's just been renamed. It hasn't really been changed a whole lot. If you record with H.264 or any of the other codecs in NVENC, you have access to a new CQ VBR mode or VBR with quality targeting. This has been available in most of the other GPU encoders from like AMD and Intel for a little while now. It's kind of interesting because, so if you don't know what the different rate control methods are for recording to video, a super quick rundown, you have constant bitrate, which is the same bitrate every second 
for the entire duration of your stream. This is what you need for live streaming because it's it's just what streaming platforms expect. It's how they buffer their streams and it works the best for streaming. When you're recording, you have a whole bunch of different options. CBR is not really considered a usable option for recording. You have VBR wherein you give it a target bit rate and a max bit rate. And so it aims at your target, but will have the headroom to go up to your max bit rate based on changes in the scene. If there's a whole bunch of action one second or something like that. And then you have CRF or CQP for GPU encoders, uh, which basically tries to target a specific quality profile. I do pretty much all of my recording at a CQP of 20, regardless of bitrate, encoder, whatever, and I get visually mostly lossless recordings for everything I do. Works great. VBR is what I used to use eight or so years ago. Great way to go if you need to keep your bitrate down. Uh, if you are worried about file sizes, if you are recording long streams and you want higher quality than your normal stream VOD, because, you know, stream bit rates are usually pretty low, but you don't want it to fill up all of your hard drives, you, you could use VBR to target a specific bit rate to kind of keep an average file size around where you'd expect it, but allow room to not totally block out if something crazy happens on stream. This new method allows you to set a max bit rate and then set a quality level to target alongside that, which trying to explain it verbally doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but but in practice you can say go anywhere from 20 to like 14 is considered visually lossless. I wouldn't go any lower than that. With, C with CQ values, lower is higher quality, zero is like placebo insane quality, 14 is visually lossless, 20 is more realistic kind of way to go. And then you, it goes all the way to like 60, which is awful quality. So you can set it to like CQP of 20. And then for my demo here, I did a recording of a target bit rate of 30 megabits per second and compared it to a, and then I did a max bit rate of 30 megabits per second because it's your max. So I compared that to a target of 15 with a max of 30. And zoomed out full picture, you may not notice a huge difference, but if you zoom in at the little details, the the target 15 max 30 versus the max 30 CQ20, there's a lot of little small details that actually look a little bit nicer with the CQ VBR mode. So if you've been using variable bitrate up until this point, this will just be a nice little quality bump for you that won't really change too much. Now, if you're using HEVC or AV1, such as for the new Twitch Enhanced Broadcasting Beta, streaming to YouTube, or just recording locally, you get a couple new options. The first is the ability to use your B frames as reference frames. Now, I explained this thoroughly in some older videos and very clearly and thoroughly in my OBS Definitive Guide course linked below if you really want to run down on all these granular options. B frames are basically frames that in, take information from the frame before it and the frame after it and use that to kind of generate frames because video compression does not encode most of the time, for, especially for these kinds of applications like streaming. You're not encoding every single frame. Full, there's just not a bit enough bit rate for that. So it basically just does like groups of movement from previous and future frames. And that's what B frames do. And you can actually use those as reference frames. Reference frames are basically the frame that it constructs to base the future frames off of, and that requires a lot more bit rate. So by setting your B frames as reference frames, you could get some better compression efficiency by not needing extra bit rate for those reference frames. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this may not make a whole lot of sense to you. TLDR, if you enable this option, you have each and middle only, you could get slight bit rate efficiency increases and improve quality by a tiny margin. If you use this option, I'd probably go middle only as the option from the dropdown. But realistically, in my comparisons, I don't think you're going to notice anything. It's it's a great option to have if you're a hardcore nerd interested in fine-tuning every possible like encoder option. Go for it. I don't think it's going to be mo worth most of your time. <laughs> Especially because you're going to be using AV1 and HEVC already. So you're already getting such a efficiency increase over H.264. The second option exclusive to HEVC and AV1 in this update is the ability to use the split frame encoding on RTX 40 series graphics cards. If you have a 4080, a 4090, or a 4070 Ti, I think, uh, some of the 4070s don't have it. But if you have the 4080 or 4090 or the 4070 that has it, you have dual encoder chips on the hardware on your card, which it can use to split up your frame in half and encode, ha encode half on one chip half on the other chip and combine it back together almost like old school SLI. Historically, whenever I introduced these graphics cards and talked about this and whatever, it only activated at 4K60 and higher 
mainly used to achieve 8K encoding and at specific presets. This now lets you use it on any preset, any resolution you wanna do. It's a toggle now that you can use to just split your frame up. The use case for this would be if you wanna target those really hardcore P6 and P7 presets in NVENC, which are a lot slower to encode. You wanna squeeze every possible bit efficiency out of your encoder. You could use that here. I will, uh, the, the only concern that would come up from this is being able to see the seam where it kind of splits in half. Ironically, I, I recorded, I, I, I demoed this back when these cards released. You don't see the seam, it's fine. I recorded a demo so that I could compare, so you had an option to see, of Warframe, where in, you know, really fast paced game, my mouse sensitivity was set way too high because this is a fresh install. So moving all over the place, if there was a seam, you were going to see it. In my OBS recording, you do not see a seam at all. Despite having VSync on, my external capture device has a seam halfway in the middle because VSync is freaking out and they're screen tearing on my recording. And so I can kind of demo what I would be worried that it looks like, but it's not present on the actual OBS recording. So there's no real downside to this other than if you're doing a whole bunch of different encodes, like you're multi-streaming or streaming and recording a higher quality. Once you get past a couple encodes, doing the split frame encoding would be a problem because you're you're going to have too much going on in the queue. I would only really use it if you're trying to do one beefy, either high resolution or high quality encode. I wouldn't use it if you have a whole bunch of multi encode sessions going because those dual chips can be used to load balance all of those different encodings rather than trying to split it across both of them, if that makes sense. Of course, there are some nice options that affect everyone. Uh, they have updated the preview scaling in your OBS canvas here so that you can get scroll bars left and right and up and down whenever you zoom in on the canvas. So if you right click your canvas, you have preview scaling in the menu and you can either just scale it to the window, which is default, that's how everyone has it. But if you wanna zoom in and like micromanage your elements, like if you're trying to resize a overlay or something, you can set it to canvas, which is gonna zoom it all the way in on what you're doing. And then you actually now have scroll bars so you can see the entire rest of your canvas, which was a little inaccessible before. So I definitely appreciate that. You also, they have switched the, speaking of setting out a stream layout or something, they have switched the way individual scene items display on the canvas to use relative coordinates to each other. Previously, they just had static locked coordinates. So if you ever resized your canvas, say th this came up a lot whenever I started recommending streaming 1440p or 4K to YouTube. Whenever you change your OBS canvas and settings video, from 1080p to 1440p or 4K, all your layouts are stuck in the top left corner and you have to go through and resize everything. With this update, you don't have to do that anymore. Even if you had a previous scene collection, everything's updated. You can now just change your canvas size and everything scales with you, which is great. I'd still recommend going in and managing your scale filtering per source, but that's freaking awesome. That is a huge, little, huge feature that changes the game for resizing canvases. Oh, a big annoyance I always had. YouTube chat integration got some more first party features that are present in the YouTube chat doc you'd normally have on YouTube's website, which is great. The YouTube integration has always been slow to catch up, so I'm always glad to see updates there. They now have a streaming integration for Amazon's IVS service, which is what you might use if you were self-hosting your stream or doing some sort of corporate thing where you you rent servers, basically you rent Twitch servers from Amazon to stream things, and they now have an integration to support that. They now have support for QuickSync's AV1 screen content coding feature, which is a feature available to Intel's most recent AV1 capable laptops with the iGPUs, or ideally next generation of Intel Arc graphics cards. The normal Intel Arc desktop graphics, graphics cards, the Arc Alchemist, available right now, uh, do not support this feature. Basically, all video encoders come optimized for mostly live action video because that's their primary use case. And so there's lots of features in there to keep quality despite sensor noise or uh, different color management or whatever. Things that don't apply to a basic flat screen capture. And so the new version of Arc has this feature that allows you to set a preset basically for screen capture stuff to allow it to not have to worry about compensating for noise and other detail that isn't there. Pretty much every encoder has this. This is just an update. Like I said, it'll only really affect the laptops for now and then ideally next generation of Intel Arc. And that's it. That is most of it. This is OBS 31. It may not seem like a huge update. They put out, a, the OBS devs put out a blog post where they are committing to a more sensible versioning system moving forward. It always seemed kind of random whether we were getting a 30 dot whatever kind of update or a full version number update like 31. And from now on, 
they are committing to if it's a big enough app update for like the entire program that would break compatibility with certain things such as when they updated the qt ui and plugins broke and things like that like they did with obs 28 if it's that kind of update it's a full version number if it's just added in little features or tweaks or whatever then it will be the sub version numbers with the dots so hopefully that makes it clear for us moving forward not a huge update overall. I do think the preview scaling and the relative coordinates for the scene items is a huge little quality of life thing for a lot of us that have struggled with that. But otherwise, I'm pretty stoked with if you're an NVIDIA user, you're kind of eating big with this update. Hope you enjoyed. Let me know what your thoughts on this beta. Again, this is all in beta right now, but it's already on beta 3, so it should be releasing relatively soon. Y'all always ask me when it's going to release. I, I don't know. I'm not the devs. They got to beta test this. Make sure it's fine first. I don't think they ever keep a strict deadline for that. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, go check out my recent video on how to survive online. I talk about my 10 year anniversary of being full time on YouTube after 18 total years here. Uh, and remember to be kind. Rewind.